So, well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And welcome to the webinar, which is about introduction to intra logistics, second part. And this is put on by DIA Squared. I'm Alex. I'm head of communications at Is the Accelerator. And in this webinar, um, I'm going to be introducing to you uh, the H squared, it, its network, our purpose, and then we're going to be taking you through all our resources, the one that we're offering right now, as part of as DH, DIH squared services, which are MOOCs. Those are free online courses about technological and digital skills. These are designed to be useful for SMEs and individuals which are working in manufacturing and robotics. Then I'll basically hand it over to, to Borja, he's our guest expert and the creator of the course that we have available, Introduction to Intralogistics, Intralogistics um, second part. And he'll take you through the, the key points and you know everything he knows about the topic. When he's done, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of, the, of, of his presentation. So let's, let's get started. DH Square believes in the power of robotics to transform the utility of manufacturing and SMEs and to drive economic growth across the EU. And our role is to facilitate the connections that enable agile production in factories. So it's where speed and versatility are essential to satisfy customer demand. And this is originally funded by, the, by Horizon 2020, which is the EU research and innovation program tasked with bringing great ideas from lab to market and we aim to generate innovation that maximizes productivity and optimizes agility in manufacturing SMEs and mid caps across all the European Union. And in addition, our goals include improving the cost effectiveness of advanced robotic solutions and driving growth of the robotics market. So we already have a large and growing ecosystem of, of different organizations that have joined our network. And if you're interested in learning more about, um, about our network and about joining, you can visit dih um, slash squared dot eu. So the DIH squared, as I said, is managed by a number of different partners from across Europe, and each is playing a different role. As I said before, I'm from ISDI, which is a business school for the digital era based in, in Spain. Madrid right now, and the role is to provide training courses that are currently open and free for anyone to access. The objectives of the course, as you can see here, we basically aim to introduce users in the European manufacturing sector to new technologies and ways of work, and to teach how to implement those, those ways of working, and to ultimately support the update of innovation in manufacturing SMEs all, all across Europe. So as you can view, our courses are available in our online platform, and that's the URL right there, dih-core.mooc.ramp.eu. You can browse the entire catalog without even registering, but if you do want to take a course, of course, you need to create an account in order to access the material, but it's quick and, and easy to, to create an account. Here, you just have an example of the different courses that are specifically focused on technology related to manufacturing and robotics, some of the courses that we offer. And here you can see a better overview of what's on this list, like the, the, the course and the expert that's developed the course and you know who will be guiding you through each course. And in addition, we have a pretty wide range of courses focused on digital skills. So these are aimed to help bring uh, your knowledge into the modern world. Topics are you know, from agile methodology, data-driven marketing, interface design and usability and more. And generally all of our courses feature videos, text, slides, graphics, and it tries to be as interactive as, as possible for the, for the learner to have like the best experience. Many courses allow you to actually take a test and test your knowledge at the end with, with self-assessment. So, the length can go from like one hour to up to more or less 10, maybe slightly less, and it depends on the topic. And again, the platform can be accessed on, on I know it's a rather long and complicated URL, but <laughs> it is what it is. And so, yeah, now I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker for today. This is Borja González. 
He has more than 10 years of experience in leadership roles, working in management and executive level, extensive global experience in talent management across industries, and is um, known as a deep expert in you know, business strategy, business development, hands-on execution, and talent development. And he's with us today to talk about his course, Introduction to Intra Logistics, second part. And we're really glad to, to have you here with us, Borja. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I guess you can hear me well, right? Okay, yes. so let me share my screen. Okay, so you see it, right? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. Just um, thank you for the introduction. Um, just as um, Alex uh, was saying, uh, also I'm, I'm uh, part of ABB Robotics, um, so one of the largest uh, robotics companies in the world. Uh, uh, so automation and technology is uh, very important for, for us. And previous to, to ABB Robotics, I was working in ASTI Mobile Robotics, so intralogistics as such, and intralogistics automation is also one of the key areas of knowledge for me and I would love to share with you a little bit of that uh, in in the, the basics of, of intra logistics. Then uh, I will guide you through the course contents, um, but first uh, we, we need to understand why is automation important, right? So there are currently key trends that are boosting automation. Um, one of them are uh, hyper customization, right? Nowadays, we all uh, want our new iPhone in the color that we like. Uh, we want uh, our shoes to be as um, uh, custom made as possible. We want all everything that we buy that is as tailor made as possible to us, right? So of course, manufacturing uh, products uh, that are ever evolving and changing in design, in features, etc. It's very demanding, and without automation, um, everything is uh, much higher cost, uh, more inefficiencies. Then we have the race of e-commerce and direct-to-consumer um, uh, approaches, where you have the Amazons uh, of the world, etc. Where and more and more companies are using e-commerce to reach the customers directly. So of course, if they do not adapt their uh, manufacturing and the efficiencies inside, now we will talk about how to do that through intra logistics. It would be very hard to compete in the environment. Then also we have labor shortage, um, especially in in the, the manufacturing areas uh, where we don't find enough people to. Um, to work on warehouses or to do certain jobs that certainly can be automated. Then this automation creates new jobs uh, that of course somebody needs to maintain, to program, etc. all these robots. So there's a shift in, in uh, a small percentage of the labor. Then you have things like the pandemic, right? If you are heavy labor intensive in, in your factory or in your uh, business, then events like these will pretty uh, will pretty much uh, affect you. While if you are heavily automated, then uh, it will be less of a problem. And then we all ha have all these green trends of sustainability, health and hygiene, and certainly robotics uh, helps to achieve these goals as well. Then some of the reasons for, for these trends and how automation solves this, well, I have already mentioned a bit, higher productivity you can reach depending on the case. Um, if you have a three shift, high intense uh, output, then of course automation is, uh, is usually of higher productivity than human labor. Then you usually save costs because if you are able to run the robots uh, 24 seven, then it, it, will much, uh, it will be much uh, more cost efficient then it will be much more flexible because robots, you can move them around the factory, you can repurpose them, you can reprogram them. So they give you a very high flexibility. And also it usually it comes down to much simpler processes because robots need to work in specific environments with a specific um, conditions. 
and this usually makes the the processes simpler they need to be simpler in order for the robots to work properly then why is intra logistics important as such well a logistics first is an umbrella term defined by the French military and um, it usually referred to supply chain from sourcing to delivery on the battlefield usually nowadays it's called supply chain management and it revolves around three axes a stock a storage and transportation management but when you focus on the internal logistics of a production plant then we use the term intra logistics but uh, all this is very important because, especially when we talk about manufacturing, but also you have in warehouses, in pretty much every company, in every business, you, you have some sort of intra logistics, rather small or large operations. Um, this is all uh, very much linked to your operation. So everything that you can do to make it more efficient, uh, that costs less, and that you are overall more profitable than. Some of the course contents uh, we will start talking about now. Um, we will start with the basics, although this is intra uh, logistics part two. Um, in between the two, you will see that they complement each other very well, and we talk uh, about different concepts. We, uh, we will, I will be focusing more on the stock management and the IT technologies to manage that stock and then some of the technologies that uh, can help to bring this to life. We will be talking about the types of stock that, um, that there are in a general basis. Then what's the need for a certain stock? Yeah, because in, in uh, how can you understand uh, what type of stock you need, how much quantity uh, of it, uh, where do you need to put it, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, we will talk a, a little bit about all these variables and how you can make up your mind on what could be the best solution for you. But there are a lot of hidden inefficiencies that uh, not right of the gate we, are, we might be aware of. And that some of those could be the inadequate forecast, uh, or some breakdowns on the on the chain, or maybe a supplier fails you, or raise prices, or the, you need to change the plant layout, or you have bottlenecks in production for whatever reason. All these things you need to be aware of in order to manage the stock um, efficiently. And then also very very important is how different corporate functions view stock. No, most of the people, oh yeah, the sales guys, well, I want to have as much stock as possible so I can sell right off the gate, or I can uh, give a discount if I can uh, get rid of um, these old stock, or the purchasing department will say, oh yeah, I want to buy large quantities because then I can negotiate better pricing with the, uh, with the um, uh, suppliers. Um, but of course the financial department can have a totally different view, no? Uh, yeah, but if we have too much stock, then we have too much capital uh, tied up or we have much higher costs or the, the stock will get soon obsolete uh, and all these things, no? So we need to be aware of how the different parts of the company view the stock management. So we try to um, uh, make uh, everyone to work well and understand why the situation is like it is. Then there is another um, interesting uh, factor that I threw in, in this course that it's not the objective for everyone, certainly, but there are, there are trends and, uh, of course, usually the most efficient you are is that the less stock you're holding. No, this is the general rule. It, it's, it, it's not always like that. It, it will depend on the case. But uh, as an example, we can have car manufacturers that mm, literally hold zero stock of the manufacturing parts for their, uh, for their cars but they will have trucks from the suppliers coming in every single day and they will only unload the parts that they need for the production of that day. No? But of course, as you can imagine, to achieve that, you need a pretty much uh, perfectly uh, linked uh, processes, uh, uh, a lot of automation, a lot of uh, good forecasting, really good uh, and precise tuck times on the production, etc. So you, you can literally understand exactly how many parts of each specific item you need but at least knowing that that, that is a possibility that it can be reached we should be working working towards okay how can i achieve that 
to my level, no? And it, it starts basically not hiding every problem that we may have, but uh, to be able to solve them one by one in order of priority. You know, what is the, the biggest priority for me? Is it cost? I have two high costs, low margin, then I need to reduce my cost as much as possible. Or is it that I, I need to change the plan layout and then I have too much space, I need to reduce this space? Whatever it might be, um, uh, these are the things that we need to assess, understand, and then try to come up with a plan to solve them. And then I threw up, uh, I threw here the Pareto principle. Um, this is a, a very simplistic uh, approach, but that works in most cases, especially at lower scale, where you will see by, uh, that um, usually the, the a smaller number of items in your inventory usually drive the higher costs. Um, and for for different reasons. No? Then if we jump to the next section, uh, we have the standardization of the operations. Now, how can we make sure that uh, our operations are as standard and optimized as possible? And it comes down to the very simple things, especially when you want to understand, okay, how can I do the pallets? Uh, are you going to do air deliveries? Then maybe you need a plastic pallet if you don't want to, if you are selling full pallets. If you are, how are you doing the order picking? What kind of uh, racking do you have, etc.? So these will guide you towards what's the best um, pallet uh, for you. Then the same we have with boxes or with even trolleys. These are very silly things that uh, uh, for most people seems like, okay, why do I have to pay attention to this? But in the day-to-day, -day, they can bring uh, accumulated efficiencies that, that will drive you better, better operations. Then we jump into more complex uh, or advanced um, uh, technologies like the mobile mini racking. These are uh, for goods to person or goods to robot applications. And this starts to get into, um, okay, how, how much throughput do you need and how much efficiency uh, is, is good for you. Then the storage basic methods. No? Again, so what in intralogistics, we can have three main uh, standard um, racking systems, the drive-ins, the standards, and the gravitary. In the course, we'll be talking a little bit more about the pros and cons of each. And it all comes down to again, what's your what's the warehouse size? What is if you have first in first out or or um, uh, other methods that you want to measure uh, that that you want to drive in your warehouse? And uh, all these things uh, are very important to to understand better, and uh, so so you can have uh, the best possible choice for for your case. Then in the logistic flows, as a general rule, uh, as a general definition, uh, the logistic flow is any material movement from a warehouse or any stop point to a different one or to a consumption point, being this uh, the another operation or another logistic flow. So I take uh, a flow is when I have to take one part or one pallet from one side of the warehouse to another. Uh, or I need to take this part to um, a consumption point where it will be put in the uh, car or in, in the product that I'm manufacturing, uh, or the finished product I need to store for then ship. And whatever it might be, these are the different flows and they are differentiated from a point A to point B, et cetera. Then we will talk about the frequency uh, because we need to be aware of what are the, our present needs but also what are the future needs and how can we uh, lower that cost of overdimensioning? Because nowadays, especially if you are in a greenfield project, the greenfield is a um, newly created manufacturing plant or warehouse or whatever it might be. Brownfield is when it's a current uh, operation that then you need to uh, re-optimize or to improve. Um, in greenfields, you don't, you don't only plan for, okay, what I'm going to be selling today, but what I'm going to be selling in 5, 10, 20 years, right? And we see that these big automated warehouses, they are not cheap. They are in the, it will depend on the size of the project, but it can be as little 
as 10 million euros or even 40 million or even larger, no? depending on the size of the warehouse. And most of the times when you start the, the production uh, or you start delivering from the warehouse, this warehouse will not be near uh, even near to 100% um, 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 capacity. No? So then over time, you need to make sure that the plan and the forecasting is, is adequate. So you don't um, uh, plan for average production, but also for peak production. Because if you have, I don't know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and all these seasonal effects, then your your warehouse needs to be prepared for also the peaks, no? And that they do not become uh, bottlenecks that will um, derail the company. Sorry. Then also something very simple to think, but it's very important, is the available paths for the transport. No? So you have the rackings, uh, you have the aisles, and then how is the, the circulation uh, in the factory? Uh, you will see if you have uh, been in, in many factories or maybe in your own, you have these uh, walk paths for forklifts, for people, uh, stop signs, uh, traffic lights, etc. Uh, this is very important because um, this will, if it would be chaos, um, then you could have uh, safety hazards, you could have uh, certainly inefficiencies, etc. So understanding what's the best path for the process to, to be followed, then you can measure, then you can improve, you can optimize these paths uh, along the way. Then interfaces and manipulations. Also, when we are uh, loading and unloading trucks, when we are uh, delivering for the port, etc., it's always important to understand. Okay, uh, do I? Is it better for me? Do I receive the trucks in pallets? Okay, then uh, should I use uh, forklifts to unload? Should I try to um, do manually from the from the truck to a conveyor? There are different uh, types that you can follow that will depend on uh, how you receive the load and how do you manipulate it. Then also the traffic constraints with other flows, we will talk about this. Uh, you don't only have, like in this picture, the traffic between forklifts and people, that's the most common, but also forklifts uh, against other robots or forklifts versus forklifts. These are the most typical situations, no? So how can you arrange the traffic in your factory in the best possible way? This is also a very interesting area that uh, we need to take into account. And uh, wrapping all up, um, we have to pair, if we want to be as efficient as possible, we have to pair the physical flow with information or the digital flow, let's say, no? Because again, in every process, we need to be able to measure if we want to improve it, but this is only one, uh, uh, one reason for doing this. Other reasons very important are to comply with sectorial rules of traceability, food or pharma, for example. Uh, if you want to trace and solve quality issues, if you want to monitor the stock levels, et cetera, uh, this is very important to, to have the right IT systems and the right technologies so you can um, uh, monitor all these and become better and better over time. Then we will jump into some of these technologies. No? How can I make sure that I pair this physical flow with the digital flow? Well, you have um, various technologies. You have barcodes and QR codes. We will see what's the difference between the two. Uh, as a general rule, QR codes usually uh, can store more data. And even if the QR code is a little bit destroyed, it's usually still readable. So, but the barcode has different uh, benefits. Then in RFID, uh, there are more, a lot of um, RFID types uh, with uh, battery, no battery, uh, like these big arcs where you pass the whole pallet through it and then it will automatically and know how many pieces of each item there is because each item is, is uh, coded, etc. Uh, there are multiple RFID technologies that we will be discussing in the course that depending on your case, will allow you to incorporate these technologies to become more efficient. Then we have the WMS or the, the software that uh, rules uh, everything. Um, and this is uh, basically an IT system that memorizes where each container and reference is, as uh, simple as that. 
Um, but of course, these needs to be paired with uh, other automation systems. The software by itself is is no good because there is a still um, a big human error. No, like if they pick the wrong part, if they, if they deliver it to the wrong place, or if they are not updating the movements that are being executed. So that's why we need all these technologies. So the person in order to uh, take the part, they need to scan it. So then the system will tell them that it's good and where they have to deliver it. So the system uh, can be more robust and leads to fewer and fewer errors. So what are some of these technologies that the WMS can be paired with, or not only the WMS, but as a general rule? Well, we can have the mini loads, um, it's usually a smaller uh, cases or boxes that um, contain small parts. And then you can have us here uh, some um, type of radio shuttle uh, at, uh, or just the mini load as uh, it, it can be said that is automated and then it will automatically bring the box to the operator and then the operator can pick the part or parts that they need. Or we have the pattern notcher or carousel that are vertical, closed um, uh, where, uh, small warehouses that again, through a screen, the operator can select what item he or she needs, and then it will automatically retrieve it or store it uh, for them. What else? We have suspended load systems. Uh, these are just, uh, as the name implies, where you are hanging the parts, and then it has it usually has uh, over the head conveyors that moves the part around uh, or just uh, stays in place. And then the radio shuttles, similar to the mini load, but uh, for uh, usually full pallets. Um, these, uh, you can place the pallet on top, or in some cases, you can even pick with a forklift the full radio shuttle with the pallet. And then you can put it in the rack you want, and the, the, the radio shuttle will bring the pallet to the proper position. So you only have to enter in the first row, and then it's easier and it comes to more confined and reduce the space. So this is one way that you can make your warehouse um, a higher capacity in lower space. And then you have the typical ASRS, automated storage and retrieval systems. These are usually the largest um, uh, warehouse automating, automated warehouses uh, that you can usually find. Um, these are fully uh, racking, very high uh, ceiling uh, automated uh, storage systems where uh, you uh, can you, you usually store pallets like you can see here, but you can store pretty much anything and it will go uh, in and out uh, in a very efficient way. Then we will also talk about transport management, conveying technologies. No, I will not mention all of them, but uh, just as the, from the regular belt conveyor to a pneumatic or vibratory conveyor that are less typical and more niche for specific applications. Um, and then again, for your product, for your uh, type of operation, what is best? We will we can we will be discussing in 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 the course. Then uh, this is also very close to my heart because as I mentioned, I was working for with Asti Mobile Robotics. So you will see a lot of pictures uh, of their uh, products here, but these are just examples. Uh, they look very similar to, to the industry standard. And I will guide you through a little bit of the, of the products that uh, there are in the market. So you have first the mouse or tunnel AGVs. They what they do is they go underneath a trolley and then with these pin hooks, uh, I don't know if you're seeing my mouse, but with these pin hooks that go up, they attach to the trolley and then they move the trolley around. So they, they could go, for example, from a picking area where an operator is putting parts on a trolley and then the AGV delivers this trolley to the uh, manufacturing area no? or to the station where these parts are going to be used. This is very, very common in the automotive industry, for example. Then we have uh, tow tractor AGVs. Um, I forgot to put the, the wagon here, but imagine that there would be a, a trolley or a wagon that attached to it and it's like a logistics train, uh, but it's fully automated. Then we have the platform AGVs. They carry the load on top 
um, and they can carry either pallets uh, where you would need like a stand, like a stand where you will put the pallet uh, so it's above the surface or the floor. And then this AGV uh, comes underneath and then lifts uh, the pallet or lifts the rack and um, it puts it in another location that you that you need. This is very common for goods to person applications as we saw in the other picture. Then we also have uh, forklift AGVs uh, for moving pallets. These are the most uh, common, but there are more and more solutions for the same type of application of moving pallets. Usually if you have a normal type of racking uh, or you have a, of or you want to move a pallet from uh, one side to the other, this is the most common one, but there are many other um, uh, type of products that can fulfill more or less the same process. Then there are tons of different navigation technologies. We will uh, talk a little bit about them in the, in the course. I will not go into a lot of detail here, but again, it will come down to what is your environment in the factory and uh, what do you really need for, for your operation? Uh, do you have a, a chaotic environment and then you need something that will go around the obstacles, but you don't care about uh, precise productivity because you don't have very high tight uh, tuck times, or on the other hand, you have to be really precise with the delivery of the parts to the station. So then you need a full, magnetic type uh, magnetic tape that um, will guide uh, the um, the AGV to every point pretty much 99% uh, accuracy every time no so again it, it, do not in this case i've seen uh, many people uh, to get excited for these new technologies that are coming out that's, and so on but again it will always come down it, nothing is obsolete if it fits you I mean, if, if the magnetic tape or if the QR codes or if the laser navigation, whatever it might be, is the right one for you, then just choose that one. But navigation technologies usually is the secondary thing. The primary thing is what is the vehicle or the AGV that you need to, for, for, to move your load. No? And then there is the AMRs versus AGVs. Um, very simple. Uh, there are many people that can uh, have uh, long arguments about this on uh, what makes an AMR or an AGV. As a general rule, an AGV has a fixed path of travel. If they encounter an obstacle, they stop and then you need to remove the obstacle and they will continue. While uh, an AMR usually has a flexible path of travel and then they can avoid obstacles and reach the point uh, by themselves as a general rule. And then we move to IT technologies for, um, for intralogistics. We have uh, five levels of IT technologies, um, for, uh, starting from the field level of sensor and signals, control level, PLC, supervisory level, SCADA, management level, MES, and then ERP with the enterprise level. We will not go into detail on all these because, again, uh, because in fact, there is a course specific that I did about supervised production and this is the key the main key part of it um, so I encourage you to check out that course as well if you are interested but here we will only talk about SCADA, MES and ERP that are the three layers that are more tied to intralogistics and operations in in the warehouse right so SCADA just very quickly stands for supervisory control and data acquisition and it's a system of software and hardware elements that allow industrial organizations to control industrial processes, monitor, gather, and process real-time data, etc. Then the MES, that is the layer above, uh, this stands for Manufacturing Execution System. And usually this takes the information from SCADA and then allows the operators to tweak and, and uh, tune their, their operations. And then the ERP is the system, as you know, like SAP or Navision or, or these ERPs that um, uh, gather everything, no? from the invoicing, uh, from the sales forecasting, uh, supplying, contracting, whatever, uh, they can do it all. And of course they are feed with the information from the factory because you could also put orders directly from the ERP into the factory. 
however, depending on, on how you are set up. Um, and then also something that is not mentioned here, but you will see in the course, um, it has to do all around with the EDI systems that allows you to connect your systems with third parties. So you can receive orders directly from, uh, from a customer of yours, making all the system, uh, all the process simpler, et cetera, is also a very interesting area. Then, okay, with all these technologies, with all these possibilities, how can I choose what are the right strategy for me or the right technology for me? This, I will guide you a little bit uh, on what to pay attention to during the course. And for me, uh, this is in my opinion, of course, um, it's to think big, but start small and scale fast. It will always depend on uh, what, what you need. No, if you are doing a greenfield, then uh, with a very ambitious and uh, high budget, then start small probably is not, is not what the shareholders want. But if in your case uh, makes sense, we think big, being ambitious, and define, define the time, define the scope, and uh, make sure that everything is centered about being profitable. A start small means, okay, what are the pilot areas that we would like to improve? How can we pilot them? How can we make sure that the benefits that we are getting are scalable? And then if it proves right, then scale fast. Okay, I've tried these, I don't know, this depalletizer for when I have an inbound track, and then this depalletizer has increased my, um, in my output through, I don't know, 20%, 25%, this is great. I will now put all these depalletizers in all my lines. This is one approach that uh, you might take. Or if it's a really proven technology that has been in the market for a very long time and you are already familiar with it, then you must just uh, implement it all at once. And then what are the priorities? No, how can I understand what are the, the priorities? Again, as a general rule, the the logistic flows the number one is the main production flows right this production flow needs to be as flawless as possible because it's the one that carries most of the weight then we have the main components flow flows or stocks type a no we are see here we are seeing here a few examples you have the full line where the car is being produced and of course that's the most important then you have the main components such as doors or the engine, et cetera, these are hi highly critical. So they need to be also uh, very important. Then we have secondary components or optionals within the product um, that are also important. But uh, if, uh, um, yeah, if, if you don't get them as good as the other ones, then that's uh, no problem. Then you have stocks type C, usually consumables and packaging. Again, less and less important than quality and return flows, and then the byproducts and residues. These are how are ranked on importance from one to six. Then in strategy, if I'm gonna implement a, a, a new technology, of course, I cannot do this on my own. I need someone to do this for me, you know? And then if it's a large or medium-sized project, probably you have different uh, parts of the project. So then what should I choose? Single integrator or uh, different suppliers per technology? Well, each of those uh, um, options have its pros and cons, and we will talk about this in the course. Uh, so it's very important to understand again, okay, how much resources you have internally so you can really manage a high complex project that would be a separate supplier per technology approach. Or if you uh, want to, have uh, someone that is highly responsible, you are able to even pay a little premium for uh, one single source, and then uh, you choose the right partner that can handle it all no, for you. Then also we need to understand uh, what is better for us. If it has to be made to measure uh, that it's exactly for us and uh, because we are so unique, our processes are so weird that we need someone to to do things made to measure or something that it's more standard that it may fit me but it has some features that i don't need uh, but okay it comes as a standard um again yeah, we will talk a little bit about these approaches and what can be what might be best for you 
Yes, uh, and then um, the, the last but not least, and it's also very important, once we are implementing all these changes and new technologies in our company, this usually means that people will need to change their way of work. Uh, people uh, will need to change roles probably within the company if uh, a robot is going to replace them. But uh, for what I've seen, most of the times if you have a guy that is doing uh, loading and unloading pallets and then you put a robotic uh, palletizer, usually they don't let go this person. They most of the times find the repurpose for, for this role within the company. So understanding uh, why these people is being moved to other and understanding and making the right communication and the, the right, so people understand why the company is making these investments and these improvements is very important. So they don't feel frustrated or they don't feel that, oh, they are just cutting people, no? So this is, this is very important to manage and I will guide you through a, a few um, uh, topics within the course. And that's it from my side. So if you have any questions or if I've gone too fast, please let me know and I will try to answer everything that I can. Perfect, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Borja. That, that was perfect. Thank you for your presentation. It was very, very clear. So, as, as Borja has We stopped hearing you, or at least myself, uh, Alvaro. I don't know if the rest can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Gorka, for uh, for giving this presentation today. It was perfect and it was very clear, as and as Gorka said before. And uh, now it's time for questions and answers. And maybe if you have uh, questions for Gorka, or you know you want to know. Uh, something about the program now. Now is the moment. Um, please could you share the slide with these university details? Thank. You. It went too fast. Uh, which which slide concretely? Uh, oh, this one, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, with the um, information to uh, contact information, right? Um, so yeah, if, if there is anyone that have any questions uh, with the courses URL. Okay, so it is, uh, these are uh, the courses and this is uh, the URL. Uh, this is directly where you can access uh, um, to the platform so you can visualize every course that we have there, including uh, the two courses that for us uh, uh, inside. So um, I think uh, nobody has any further questions. So uh, as we said before, this is a set of webinars that we are, we are having uh, uh, from here until the end of May, maybe to uh, June. Uh, this is, these are the upcoming webinars. We have very interesting topics like interface design, uh, or robotic shop floors, even uh, AI. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned and uh, you can check uh, this is upcoming, uh, like the dates, you can check them here on this uh, social media that we have. Uh, you can follow us in, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and also you can follow uh, the Square Square uh, social media pages that we also have in LinkedIn and other social medias. So um, 
as, as I said before, if we don't have any further questions, this will be the end of this webinar. And thank you, thank you everyone for coming today. And especially, thank you very much to Borja for this great session. And uh, yeah, see you soon in, in the next ones. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, thank you for coming. Thank you, Ricardo, Mario, Joao, Timeo. Thank you, uh, everyone. Bye.